The primary method of informal organization in Congress is the caucus. Now, we've used this word before in two different ways, in a primary and then uh, back in the old days, this is how they picked the nominees. But this is, it's all really the same use of the word. This is just a different type of caucus. They are informal, and they help to organize co uh, Congress. They're usually a small group of members. Uh, well, that's not true. Sometimes they're, they're, they're really big. Um, of Congress who share some interest or characteristic. Uh, so, for example, uh, the representatives uh, from farm states <clears throat> who grow corn, let's say, might have a corn caucus where they meet together to discuss and make sure they're all on the same page about issues related to corn. Um, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus is one of the, the, the more well-known caucuses, and these are uh, representatives from black districts. They historically have not necessarily had to be black themselves, but if they represent uh, heavily uh, African-American districts, uh, they might join this caucus. Um, <clears throat> we call the Democrats in Congress the Democratic Caucus and the Republicans the Republican Caucus, this uh, maybe caucus in its largest uh, sense. Um, the Tea Party uh, had a Tea Party Caucus. Progressives have a Progressive Caucus. Uh, conservative Democrats have the Blue Dog Caucus. But this is how it works. And they typically organize around some common area of policy concern or, or interest. There's about 300 caucuses these days in Congress. And they, they've really expanded. They've grown a lot in, in the last few decades. They will pressure uh, for committee meetings and hearings and votes on bills. So if you've got a vote coming up about fishing, uh, congressmen for, and, and senators from the, the districts that have a lot of fishing in their district <clears throat> will probably have a caucus around that. And they're going to get involved and very active in trying to uh, uh, shape that bill or, or kill it or make sure it gets passed, depending on how they feel about it. Caucuses can be even more effective than lobbyists because basically what's happening there is there may be an issue that you don't care much about because it doesn't impact your district but other members of Congress do, and they're essentially coming and lobbying on behalf of their constituents because it affects their district, and it may not be a major issue to you. Congressmen get a staff. By the way, I should point out that the cost of, uh, to each American of actually running Congress, of paying everybody, paying the, the legislature itself, and, and all the, the cost of the day-to-day -day running of it, is about $10 a year per American citizen. Congress itself is not expensive to run. Now, the things that they approve can be very expensive, obviously, but uh, Congress itself is fairly cheap. <coughs> uh, the personal staff works for the member, and they, they provide constituent service. Um, that means, for the most part, they help. Uh, constituents mean the voters uh, who live in that person's uh, district, and so they help those people. Uh, but they also can help with legislation, too. They can uh, uh, help write bills or, or research bills or things like that, Give write up summaries of bills. The committee staff, these are staffs that don't work for congressmen, that's personal staff. They work for committees. So the Health and Human Services Committee will have its own staff. And they organize hearings, they do research around the bills that, that the committee is going to be looking at. Um, they'll actually write legislation uh, that, that the, the members of the committee can then choose to, to adopt or not. Um, and they're often the target of lobbyists. If you're the, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, the lobbyists are going to be all over you just as if you were, I'm sorry, if you're the uh, the chief staffer of the of the Appropriations Committee, you're going to have lobbyists all over you, just like as if you were the, the chairman, because you have a lot of power. There are also three staff agencies, the CRS, the GAO, and the CBO, <clears throat> and they're, they're professionals who provide information to Congress. The CRS is the Congressional Research Service, and these are researchers. These are people who are trained how to go and research and put together reports on a topic. And so if Congress is wondering about, say, I don't know, the impact of having female combat troops, um, they would ask the CRS to, to look around the world and do research and come up with uh, data on what the impact of that has been. Uh, the GAO is the General Accounting Office. Um, the General Accounting Office does exactly what you think it would do. It keeps track of how much money is being spent by different agencies. And it's kind of their job to make sure the agencies aren't spending more than they should. The Congressional Budget Office is a, a second group of economists. Uh, well, the account, GAO is kind of accountants. The Congressional Budget Office is an economist who every time a bill gets uh, out of committee, they will then estimate its impact on the economy. Will it create or, or, or uh, reduce jobs? Will it, um, how much will it cost? How much gen uh, revenue will it generate? How much might it save? And so they create estimations of the economic impact of bills. Um, they are nonpartisan. These are professional economists who are there regardless of who's in charge. 
but they can often be attacked if they say something one side doesn't want to hear. For example, the, uh, the, the health care bill that President Obama uh, uh, had pushed and Congress passed um, actually is going to save money, uh, according to the Congressional Budget Office, um, although frequently Republicans will, will claim that the Congressional Budget Office is biased or they're on Obama's side and they're lying about that. Uh, but that's not really true. That's just political stuff.